Most startups typically build for the good path and then discover the bad path and fix it. Right. You can't do that in payments, right? You can't. You just can't do that in financial services it's and payments. It's people's money. It's people's it's, money. It gets. So I think the speed, the reliability, and the security ultimately is better in UPI, and therefore it is succeeding. But the the way the UPI protocol has been designed, right. there is a very clear separation of concern between authentication and authorization. A good software engineer ultimately is someone who understands the problem statement, and then is able to build solutions, tooling automation, impact that you create, learnings that come from that impact, to be taking that back to the problem statement and fixing it and taking it back to market. That kind of gratification is what keeps engineers most excited. You realize that, uh, yes, uh, tech can rule the world, but there is a part of uh, a lot of what happens on a daily basis that is a combination of technology enabling people to do much better. We look at ourselves as a highly scalable, performant and intelligent distribution platform. Our consumer journey is basically the consumer's journey with money, starting with send money, moving to spend money, then to manage money and finally grow money. What Cred does, we do. What Grow doesn't part or Zero Dollar doesn't part through mutual funds, we do. Then there is some, something that say uh, an Aqua does or a Policy Bazaar does. So we are a company of companies, but I don't think necessarily somebody like us becoming the bank is the solution. Right. I think in the whole concept of fintech, the role that we can play is actually to be that layer on top of banking in partnership with all the banks, to be able to not just create better experiences, but to also create completely new products. Hey, hi. Uh, welcome to yet another episode of Scalar Pod. And uh, today we have with us here today Rahul, founder and CTO of PhonePay. Uh, thank you for coming, Rahul. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start off with uh, the first question, which uh, usually sort of like an icebreaker, but I really love the different answers I get from different people. Um, but uh, what does a day at work for the city of PhonePay look like? Uh, I think a day at work for me is kind of split between almost two roles that I have, which is founder and CTO. Okay. So uh, uh, typically I start early. I prefer to start early because uh, the madness is always less in the first half. <laughs> So I get into office, grab my cup of coffee or tea, and uh, I read. I have I, I have a huge backlog of uh, reading, of just the confluence pages that my team has created for different things. And typically, it's out of band. In the case, development at PhonePay is not uh, as regulated as you know what, as the CTO or even uh, my chief architect or the architects group know about everything that's happening. But we believe that people should, as long as they're following certain principles, can move forward. But we create some documentation, we review it out of band. So I think. That's my opportunity to kind of even catch up on everything that's happening on the uh, platform side uh, right. on PhonePay. And then the second half of the day or pretty much after uh, 11 is a combination of uh, reviews, some uh, design reviews, some decisions that are typically blocked because of uh, is this, we have an approach that is more short term, we have an approach that is the right way that's long term, that's the right platform some of those decisions, some design reviews, etc. Then there's governance meetings that happen. We are we actually significantly more structured from trying to actually have a hands-off but eyes-on approach to a lot of the business verticals, etc. So there are a lot of these governance and review meetings that Samir and I run. We have a divide and conquer approach in terms of what are the parts of the company that we look at almost end to end. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the uh, new BFSI initiatives which are in the zero to one phase is something that I lead so uh, it doesn't, not necessarily just as the CTO, but as the founder. So a lot of time goes in that. So it's pretty much a combination of those every day. And uh, the founder hat also forces me to have a lot of external interactions, meetings, regulatory and compliance interactions and meetings, both internal and external. So I don't have a necessarily a set pattern for a week because of that. But, but yeah, I think that's the real answer. Nice. Do, do you still some occasionally get times to get in the weeds of like code or Figma diagrams and all of that stuff or? 100% on uh, design, uh, architectural decision, tech choices. Me and a group of us, right? Yeah. Uh, Shantanu Sinha, Fanish, Kaushik, uh, uh, the architects and some of the uh, almost day one uh, engineering team have a very, I would say, a stranglehold on uh, tech choices within the company and we still hold it like that. We prefer to be a pretty homogeneous stack. Like architecture council. <laughs> Almost. We don't call we don't call it that, but uh, but yeah. So uh, product and design. Uh, we again have a very 
uh, regulated model. We have something that is called a uh, product design review, which is basically the overall wireframing strat, then the design, and we weigh in quite a bit uh, between Samir, me, and Vishal, who's the head of uh, product because uh, we realize that if we don't have something like that, we end up randomizing the company. <laughs> One of us will come later and say, Ye kya chal hai? why is this like this? So we kind of uh, said that, let's have this, then we hold our peace. Yeah. If any two of us are there, uh, we do that. Uh, coding itself, I don't do. I don't do anymore. It's been, I don't think at PhonePay, I don't have a single line of code uh, okay. that is in uh, production. After the first 16 years, I would say, of my career, I haven't really coded uh, a line of code into production. Okay. So I don't do that. Hopefully, I bring value in other ways to the tech team. That's that's uh, great to know. And I'll uh, like double click more into uh, what what happens day to day on phone pay a little bit more. But before that, I'd love to you know uh, walk through sort of your uh, tech career journey so far, like how it started, what all stuff have you built before phone pay as well, and then you know how phone pay came into being. Uh, so yeah, I've, so I'm actually pretty old. I guess, <laughs> uh, compared to a lot of other folks in the startup ecosystem. Uh, I finished my bachelor's in engineering, computer engineering from Bombay back in uh, 95, okay. uh, 99. I started in 95, graduated in 99, went off to the States to do my master's. Uh, it was almost herd mentality at that point to say that GRE de do, you get a good score, <laughs> you apply. Uh, fortunate enough to be, uh, I got into Purdue University, finished my uh, computer science from there. Uh, graduated at the peak of the dot-com bust. I was initially at uh, Sun Labs in uh, Mountain View, uh, working with the likes of Gosling. Uh, uh, pure research labs, right? Sun Labs was pure research. It wasn't Sun Microsystems. And uh, I was working on uh, uh, a transactional rollback JVM. Very, very interesting because this was basically to modify the uh, virtual machine to actually support uh, a transactional construct that can be completely atomic and rolled back. My uh, mentor was Jacques, who was a, a fellow at Sun Labs at that point. Uh, spent uh, some time there, but after about eight months, uh, I did not feel that I necessarily had the bent for a research-oriented role in a lab. I realized from that point itself that building stuff that has uh, at least some sort of impact that I can actually measure versus being on a path that was significantly more uh, uh, research oriented is what excited me. I had a bunch of uh, options to join IBM, uh, Intel and a startup called Andiamo Systems, uh, chose Andiamo. So the first 10 years of my career was completely in embedded software. Okay. So I was working on storage area networking. Uh, uh, started in the uh, sand space at a startup. Uh, this was again back in uh, early 2001. And uh, my uh, first 10 years was completely uh, uh, spent building the control plane and the data plane for uh, a sandbox. Okay. Uh, at Andiama Systems, we built out the first actual uh, intelligent uh, storage area network uh, card which would be something that would uh, virtualize storage in the network. Okay. So effectively, uh, storage and networks allow you to connect uh, a bunch of storage devices and discover it on the network, mm -hmm. right, compared to NAS. What, this allow, what, what we did allowed you to also create disks or virtual uh, logical units, VLANs as we called it, right, uh, out of any storage in the network, which means effectively, instead of creating these on hosts, like Veritas would be a company that would create these on the host, mm -hmm. we would create it in the network and you would actually have disks that are created in the network that you could mount from the network itself and build file systems on top of that. Nice. And then we built... Uh, uh, a bunch of uh, constructs for uh, data replication, archiving, backup, everything in the network so that your hosts, which typically till then, the sun boxes and the spark stations that were doing it, mm -hmm. could become dumb terminals as far as storage was concerned. Okay. Right? Very exciting times. I mean, that time it was uh, bits and bytes engineering, uh, <laughs> not cut-paste engineering. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> uh, uh, you spend all the time in the lab, uh, uh, data plane debugging is extremely tough. Yeah, on right? hardware, of course. Uh, uh, you had to actually insert data patterns and then use a Finisar box to actually get data terms, go through it, and only then debug. Even control plane was kernel debugging. So first uh, 10 years of my career was all that. Uh, that company got acquired by Cisco. I was with Cisco. The same business unit continued in Cisco. Uh, then I decided to move back to India. Uh, always... Uh, wanted to come back and do something on my own. Right. 
uh, I was in US. It was very difficult to actually uh, give up the love for a paycheck and <laughs> <laughs> do something. The real answer is that uh, with the whatever I, I had done in that first ten years in the US, I felt comfortable enough to come back to India and try something on my own and right. take the risk. At least for two years, I wouldn't have to worry about a paycheck, right? Mm. And moved back, moved back with Cisco. Spent a year at Cisco, soft landing. Yeah. I never worked in India before that, and this was me moving to Bangalore back uh, in two uh, thousand. Yeah, I never worked right. So moved back straight to Bangalore, at Cisco. In fact, I was working right down the road here, okay. at Cessna Business Park, and this road was even actually it was worse that time <laughs> than it is uh, now. Oh, these tech parks had not come up at that time. The tech parks had not come up that time, and uh, Cessna Business Park was at, well. I don't know if this tech park was there, but Cessna Business Park was very new. Yeah. Cisco was there. It was a great time that one year, and I started formulating what I do. Uh, that time, ET Power of Ideas had launched. Okay. Uh, ET Power of Ideas was this initiative to submit ideas, do a elevator pitch, and possibly get funded, okay. right, for some very small amount. So I submitted uh, my pitch, built a prototype. And I got selected in the uh, top 500 pitches. Okay. I got an elevator pitch for that. Uh, after the top 500, I didn't make it, but I continued with that, and therefore I quit and started something called Bhumi.com. Okay. Uh, didn't go far with that, but uh, it was basically the thought process was this was because when I came in, I was trying to buy a place. I realized that prices of real estate is like all over the place. It's what people tell you. There is no public domain data. There is a cash market that nobody is aware of. The guidance value doesn't mean much. Yeah, yeah. So what I was trying to do is uh, crowdsource information on a map about, like, I bought a house in this area, anonymized. You don't have to give for so much price. And I said that at scale, that would triangulate to actually knowing what is the right market value right. of property. Right? Nobody really knows what's the market value of property even today very well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was the thought process. I started Boomi.com. Kind of the interface would be what housing had done later. Uh, or And there was already a company in the US called Zillow doing that. But Zillow, they, yeah. Uh, they, Zillow was uh, different. There is public domain data. Yeah. They put it on a map so you'd see it. Here, there is no public domain data. So it's crowdsourced data on a map, right? Yeah. yeah. Started that. Samir, who, Samir and I know each other for a very long time now. We've known each other for uh, 27 years, right? My co-founder, Samir. And, yeah. Uh, we've always been kind of bouncing ideas off each other. We did a college project together in engineering. <laughs> so met at a friend's wedding. Uh, he was graduating from Wharton. And he told me, what is this you're doing in real estate tech? Let's sell music. <laughs> <laughs> so so I dumped Boomi.com and we started Manoramic.com, which was a music download store. Just a few of us, we started uh, our office in our alma mater in Bombay, in our college. Okay. So we went back there. We were uh, alumni. They had built a new building. They had space. So we started there. We hired engineers from uh, the Sadar Patel College of Engineering, where Samir and I graduated, into Manoramic.com. I mean, not many engineers, right? It was me, uh, Jay Chavra, who's with me at Phone Pay still. Yeah. Uh, Shailesh as the designer, who's still with me at Phone Pay. A bunch of others, a uh, couple of others who are now in the States. Uh, five of us, we were coding. We built out the uh, music download store with streaming. Uh, we built uh, uh, encryption, uh, kind of the uh, technology that would allow you to send an encrypted stream. We would embed the uh, code to be able to decrypt that stream in the stream itself. This is like before like L1, L3, DRM and all yeah, the standard yeah, and yeah, all of yeah, that. Yeah. Before, the, before <laughs> that. Yeah. Before that. <laughs> and it was all action script because there were flash players. Ah. So this was in action script. Embed that so that the flash player could then decode on the fly and play. Ah. All of that stuff. Right? Very good fun. But didn't go anywhere. Uh, pivoted serendipitously to a B2B play. Started powering... Uh, uh, because we had all the content, we had this technology, we had search, we had metadata, album art, APIs for all of this, and then we built capabilities to turn on, turn off these APIs for any client and billing. Okay. Because uh, Google India Labs wanted to start streaming and they were redirected by Saregama, Sony and other labels to say that, hey, there is this company called Manoramic, they've done all this, why don't you take the content from them? We said, you know, this is all our IP, we're not giving up the content, but we'll power you. <laughs> that, that, that time... Young and stupid enough to tell Google, we'll power you, but we're not giving you the content. 
uh, they poo-pooed us a bit, but then they said, let's test you. They tested us. Uh, obviously, we had a CD in fronting us and all that, but they were pretty impressed with what we had built, and we started powering Google Music India Labs for streaming. That was a free streaming service back in 2010 that Google, Google had a Google India Labs which shut down. Did that, and from there, we became known as this tech partner to all the music labels okay. that would power. So we powered a lot of streaming sites, right. <laughs> legal streaming sites, <laughs> not the illegal ones. And Flipkart wanted to do the same thing, came to us, meeting of minds, uh, techies, techies. I mean, Samir is a techie, I'm a techie, we're all techies. So Bini met us, Mekin met us in office, Amod met us. Uh, I'm assuming it was love at first sight. Within a couple of days, they said, you know what? We could just do a commercial contract, but prefer to actually acquire you guys. Why don't you come and build what you were building as a B2C here? We said, yes, second chance to build a B2C music play. <laughs> Went back into Flipkart, did Flipkart, uh, uh, flight MP3 and flight ebooks. Yeah. Still, I would say my favorite product uh, and platform. We shut it down, but those are the first native apps out of the Flipkart stable yeah. across iOS, Android, Windows 8, etc. Yeah. I think I was. Uh I was not yet in college. I think I was still in school. I think. When did you release? Damn, this? you make me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is this was 2012. 2012. Yeah, 2012. So 2012 is when I graduated from school. Yeah. Like, uh, so uh, that's what I, I I remember. Like I think I, I uh, was very excited seeing flight because I think there was a bunch of other things also at the time coming out. Uh, Microsoft had this uh, player called Zune or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and uh, those were all MP3 player kind of things. MP3 Zune. player kind not of things. Not true software on a phone. Yeah, yeah. And on software, I think uh, like there wasn't anything better than Windows Media Player even. Yeah. At that time. And uh, when Flight came out, I think all this was exciting because, hey, there's an app being made out of India. And uh, Flipkart itself was obviously uh, uh, like a shining beacon at that time itself. Yeah. Uh, and there weren't that many. But Flipkart only had an M site. There was no Flipkart retail app. There was no app. No yeah. App. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this needed an app, right? I mean, this was uh, DRM music. Hmm. Had to have your own player. Had to have, uh, because the license doesn't allow us, uh, us to give you uh, unencrypted files. Yeah, yeah. So we built, uh, embedded our own player, built it, our download manager for your ebooks. Again, the different things that we tried, rental, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember looking at the app and thinking like, you know, uh, how have they made this? Because, uh, you know, I was just tinkering with mobile apps at the time and nobody had smartphones even. In India, it was fairly rare. Uh, and uh, like I think uh, the price point also like I mean smartphones were 40,000 rupees and you know a Nokia phone is like 5,000 rupees uh, and uh, my uncle gifted me one because I was so interested in uh, this stuff I think that was 2011 or so and uh, like it's been a year I was trying to make apps and everything um, for me the thing was like even if I came up with an idea I wouldn't know who would use it because nobody <laughs> I knew he was using a smartphone uh, like the closest to a smartphone would be like a Nokia 5880 yeah. Express Music <laughs> but then uh, I was like you know that's a great app how, how have they made it because you know I was like still making to-do lists and all in my app but you yeah. know we had built a, a music player and an app for Symbian phones yeah, yeah, yeah. I have made Symbian apps those SIS <laughs> those, uh, jar files and jar know, files yeah, file and yeah. with, uh, all of that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah for me like there was no place to even learn how to build these things but seeing like an app, like also, especially like seeing an app which is made by the OEM themselves, like by Nokia or by Google, it's like, okay, fine. They know how to build the OS, they would probably, but when you see somebody else building it, like how have they built that app? Because like, you know, the, there is no idea to even make things on and, you know, it, <laughs> you to build it a different place, push it into, there's no debugger, all of that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I remember flight because it's like, uh, hey, this is a nice app. This is like a sexy looking app. How have they made it? Like designs and all were actually yeah. really nice uh, back then. Uh, yeah, and then after flight. So flight, uh, as part of uh, reorg within Flipkart, I moved to uh, leading engineering and product for supply chain, which is eCart today. Okay. Uh, four years did that. I mean, uh, it's, it's one of the best uh, learning experiences I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I think until then, the, uh, you can conquer the world using technology, right? The typical uh, chip on the shoulder we all engineers have was very, very high. Once you got into supply chain. Logistics. And logistics. This, it's the most humbling experience anybody can get. I mean, the, the kind of uh, respect, I mean, you've been in Zomato, yeah, you I've would seen, know yeah. Dunzo, what you do, but what a Flipkart does with eCart, right? You realize that, uh, yes, uh, tech can rule the world, 
but there is a part of uh, a lot of what happens on a daily basis that is a combination of technology enabling people to do much better yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, then there is appreciation for operations there's appreciation for processes process design uh, yeah. value stream mapping uh, all of that yeah, right yeah. and i think i came out much richer with high level of appreciation for all functions and i think it actually crystallized what is the definition of a good software engineer a good software engineer ultimately is someone who understands the problem statement yeah. and then is able to build solutions tooling automation i think sometimes we shy from using these words that tooling is not really a, a software engineer's <laughs> job right uh, it is uh, operations or is uh, support operations etc but i think you'll have to actually figure out what's the problem statement what is the right solution using technology do you really have to build a full fledged service platform uh, its own database or is it a simple tool uh, technology becomes a means to the end if you define the end correctly i think that's what i learned from uh, supply chain kind of role got extremely administrative for me for my liking i mean a uh, very large team uh, uh, but on a day to day basis i felt i was just running from meeting to meeting Hmm. Surface area becomes very wide on. Yeah, and it's, it's interfacing with operations. Correct, correct. And I still, I think I I do enjoy that part quite a bit, and I still actually interact a lot with all the teams. But I was not getting the uh, joy of building something on a daily basis, and I think looking back, I could have done that at Flipkart itself, and uh, it's how I approach uh, now work at PhonePay. I think it's been a learning. So that's how PhonePay happened. So Samir and I both had quit, and we're thinking what to do. Uh, two other things: flight MP3. Uh, most people think it's because of piracy that music didn't take off at that point. There are multiple reasons. Piracy was one of them, but I think uh, at our population, even the niche that really looked for convenience, right? I mean, uh, torrent sites and all that is really for the top of the pyramid who really know how to use it. It's not necessarily for everybody. True, true, true. And people would pay. Problem is micro payments. There was this was in 2012. There were no wallets also. There was no right. Paytm's and all. You think of you are selling tracks at five rupees. Think of whipping out a debit card or a credit card, which itself was less to make a payment. You can't do COD for digital content. I think micro payments back then, if I remember correctly, like uh, there used to be tie-ups with Airtel, Vodafone, and all. You could deduct from the balance. That, that, was, the the vast, that was the only way. That was the vast play. That was the, the only, only way. Play, right. Possibly. So that was the main reason. Then obviously, Big Billion Day had this uh, first Big Billion Day. first 15 minutes of the sale almost every payment gateway in the country was down hmm. right uh, everybody had promised us uh, we to do tatkal reservations flipkart ka will be nothing for us as traffic <laughs> but uh, flipkart has always proved everybody uh, wrong payments was down and that was a huge problem we've seen payments get approved and then rejected afterwards after the order has been placed and then you have overbooking you have cancellation of the nightmare COD one of the biggest innovations that Flipkart has done right yeah at scale COD is again a nightmare yeah yeah i mean there's a cost to cash collection and obviously other things like counterfeit notes mm. security there have been armored cars from certain hu- hubs for taking the money to the banks at the end of the day because that's the amount that you collect yeah yeah when yeah. you start selling phones for the country so i think there's the realization that uh, if payments is solved at the infrastructure level you will enable india to become digital and digital businesses will actually then get created truly right become a reality that's how phone pay was born and uh, it's been a phenomenal ride to say the least so far <laughs> uh i think uh, i i i remember uh, like i think the first time i came across you the it was 2000 uh, 14 or 15 there was this uh, hack india hackathon and uh, i think uh, phone pay was just a year old at that time you ah, were yeah, yeah. you were there one of the sponsors yeah. uh, our team won that hackathon and i think uh, you, you were asking like some of the winning teams like if there people would be interested in joining and all <laughs> i think i sent you a cold uh, linkedin linkedin yeah, also yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh so actually i think uh, for, for the uh, i think podcast also when i was going to reach out i think linkedin uh, you had uh, sent me a reach out uh, i think uh, three times before <laughs> <laughs> i'm very persistent <laughs> uh, once was then and uh, then one was i think uh, when i was at uh, zomato uh, yeah so uh, but yeah, i think uh, f- that's that's the first time i i got to know about phone pay actually because you were the sponsors there and uh, like i think phone pay i never heard of it i, I was staying in delhi mm. right uh, bangalore there might have been you know people i, I think at that time nobody in bangalore also would have heard of us ah. <laughs> yeah. 
so <laughs> very early days yeah 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 so when i heard about it i was like oh nice so you know there's like uh, paytm was the only other i think uh, doing uh, stuff like that interesting and uh, so with with uh, phone pay uh, like how was it initially like was it uh, like you eventually uh, got back at uh, flipkart as well so um, how did that happen like you saw, saw synergies again like you know solving payments for flipkart yeah i think uh, the intention was never to actually come out build something and go back into uh, flipkart mm-hmm. and now we are again out of flipkart uh-huh. so uh, most people think that was a very calculated engineered move it wasn't uh, i think it was again when we started and uh, because this was we had a certain amount of what you'd call as possible street cred mm-hmm. in trying to build something new we had had a startup earlier we had gone through the flipkart which is uh, even today considered the uh, holy grail for learning how to actually build a startup and yeah. do it yourself so we had uh, when we were starting off and uh, uh, we had started off initially even without upi we were trying to build something over we were trying to build a upi equivalent as a brokering layer on top of imps and convince every bank okay. and then we came across thanks to uh, uh, the india stack team we came across the fact that something like upi is there and then it was like love at first sight said that if if we want to achieve what we think we want to achieve it's going to happen through upi right we were all in from day 1 yeah. and then we started even uh, even but even before the whole upi switch just on the back of what we were doing we had got term sheets from a couple of vcs to get started small amounts not like the i think today a uh, uh, seed is probably larger than what we were getting <laughs> even 7 uh, years back <laughs> that's a different problem but uh, and then uh, bini was uh, uh, back heading uh, flipkart and flipkart in the past had tried to actually build out a payments play more than once there was uh, payzp fkpg etc and overall there was always this thing that e-commerce and payments kind of go together yeah. there's been uh, ebay paypal there's been uh, ali with uh, ali pay so uh, bini was very interested conversation started about flipkart coming in as an investor see for for us we really wanted to actually build and we wanted to build the uh, largest transaction platform in the country and then enable businesses on top of that that was the vision at that time we didn't want to actually keep raising money we seen the kind of uh, load it takes on founders and their teams and short term decisions etc yeah. flipkart gave us that leeway to say that don't worry we have you covered so we struck deals of being completely independent that's why phone pay has always been independent of flipkart right from branding to neutral position working with the industry mm-hmm. enabling for upi and flipkart has been amazing about honoring that contract we said that you know we don't want to raise money so let's just fold back into flipkart and just build So I think slightly different thinking we never we never I don't think we think about necessarily uh financial gain as the first thing mm. those things will happen along the way yeah. if we can actually build the best product so whatever allows us to build the best product and platform yeah. should take precedence and I think that's how flipkart happened right 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 um uh, and about I, i want to you know sort of uh, get into uh, like the early days of uh, like upi and phone pay as yeah. well um and especially like uh, i mean today it's it's uh, there's so many things that exist like i mean things like upi too like even i think the nfs and imps they work so much better than what it was back then uh in a time when like you were saying like in a big billion day sort of crashes all payment gateways uh what were sort of like the challenges like both tech and on ground on on like if you have a uh agenda in mind which is to build the uh, largest possible payment gateway in india yeah uh what were sort of the initial hurdles and how did you overcome that i think the bet on upi i think was a phenomenal one right yeah. but it is upi itself has gone through a maturation mm-hmm. it has been extremely compressed as a time cycle if you look at it i mean upi is 7 uh, years old you yeah. can't imagine that something like this is just 7 years old i mean it came into existence 7 years back right right so uh, it has gone through its maturation the early days were uh, extremely tough yeah. from a, a success rate uh, uh, transactions going into what's called as a deemed state which is basically a debit has happened but a credit has not happened and the reversal is not instantaneous right right so i think there is a lot that you need to do from a understanding so the most startups typically build for the good path and then discover the bad path and fix it 
Yeah. You can't do that in payments, right? You can't. You just can't do that in financial services it's and payments. It's people's money. It's, it's people's money. It gets stuck. So yeah. the way we operated from a tech perspective was to always think of everything that can possibly go wrong. Right. So what are reconciliation mechanisms? Something that happens from day one. Right. I mean, even in e-commerce, you don't think of the level of reconciliation that you need to do until later when you discover through customer service, etc. Yeah. As and when we realize what all can happen from a protocol perspective. So we are. So I think one thing that we did well was we actually uh, studied the UPI protocol very deeply. We engaged with uh, NPCI and the India Stack team very early on to understand it better, give our suggestions. They were very, very open to suggestions on how it should operate. And we were able to actually build around the possible failure paths right. much better, right? Uh, things like uh, if it's a merchant transactions that is going to hit, if it's an acquired merchant and it's going to be uh, hitting the uh, sponsor bank that we have as an acquiring account, right? irrespective of whether the CBS is up at that point or not, we can actually create a middleware that will be owned by the bank to be able to make sure those success transactions are 100% successful, yeah. right? Those are examples of innovation that we've done on top of UPI very early on mm. to be able to ensure that we cater to a very, very high success rate. Yeah. Outside of that, I think uh, being very open about uh, uh, failures, data that we are seeing with the ecosystem, trying to actually shape the banking ecosystem and the other players by taking a very open data approach to failures, success rate, uh, how many transactions are going through, what are the kind of transactions that are failing. Uh, same thing on the uh, risk and fraud detection side, being very open about sharing, okay, these are the kind of uh, patterns that we are seeing. Right. With a view of, I think, if we are to succeed, UPI needs to succeed and the ecosystem needs to succeed, right? That versus thinking that, is this competitive information? Are we sharing too much, right, et cetera? Right. That was always a philosophy from day one. And I think it's helped us a lot. I think what we have as Pulse today, Pulse is a platform where we publish aggregated anonymized data of phone pay. Okay. Uh, we have the APIs available on uh, the public GitHub account and we have a visualization layer. So you can go see how many transactions a quarterback are happening in which pin code, in which district, by which category. Right. And uh, I think that's how we've operated and that's actually been uh, something that we believe has been our contribution towards UPI where UPI's contribution towards our success has been Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Our uh, little contribution has been to try and shape it towards success by being very open about uh, data and all the other patterns that we're seeing. Right. For example, uh, Shantanu and team have built an amazing uh, uh, predictive logic platform, mm -hmm. which we call a skill switch, which basically takes a look at all lead indicators and lag, lag indicators and uh, has a, a prediction about the success of a transaction based on the actors in the system. The actors could be the, uh, the sender's bank account, the receiver's bank account, uh, the merchant, the uh, location of the transactions for whatever reason, uh, ISPs play a role, and they will actually pull a kill switch on the transactions and not allow a transaction to go through at all. Okay. Versus try and attempt a transaction that has a slightly lower probability of success. Got it. And it actually uh, uh, tunes to the threshold also automatically versus trying to actually have a fixed threshold like below 80% are not allow, above 80% allow. It really depends on the bank, etc. what really should be the threshold. Right. So in, in that way, it's a evolved system that actually does, it's an evolved ML model that actually does uh, prediction about the success rate of a transaction and we'd rather not let a transaction go through yeah, yeah. Then, and lose transactions because because in a time window that you pull the skill switch, you probably have 30-40% of transactions going through. Yeah, yeah. At scale, that is a large transaction loss for a platform whose core reason for existence as a business is driving more transactions. Yeah. But we choose to do that because that's right by the consumer when it comes down to payments. Yeah, And yeah. we use technology for that, right? So, yeah. I think those uh, stuck uh, transactions are something that people mostly uh, complain about uh, yeah. in, in general in payments, right? Uh, I think uh, I've seen that like sometimes, you know, trying to pay somebody like look, this time, this bank transaction uh, failure rates are high. So we're not allowed to pay via Correct. this bank and all Correct. that. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Um, so uh, another thing is like, uh, and I'm, I'm very sure a lot of the audience would be uh, really interested in this question is like uh, looking back at the early days when you were starting to build it, uh, the choices uh, of uh, you know, like things like language, tech stack, frameworks, database where you're storing stuff, uh, you know, uh, and then like the shape of the cloud as well. Uh, which one of them, uh, which one of those choices do you think have were, you know, great choices back then and worked out in the long term, which ones you had to go back and change also? 
I think we've stuck to most of the choices and we made a lot of the choices uh, fairly, it's not been very organic in our case. Uh, it has been uh, fairly studied choices. Got it. Uh, based on uh, a few things. One is a very practical approach of uh, the early set. What is our uh, core strength in whether it's a programming language, whether it's data stores that we've uh, worked with at scale, right? The the thing about scale has always been uh, uh, front and center. In fact, uh, one thing is we've always built for scale from day one. So we, we, we built for uh, almost 10 months, more than 10 months before the launch, right? We took our time and we built for, at that time it used to be, our goal was to do at least a million transactions a day, mm. right? For our day one platform should be able to do million transactions a day, transactions a day. And the architecture has not changed significantly from that time to uh, the 150 million transactions a day that we do today. Mm. It's not changed significantly. It's improved incrementally, but it's not been large rewrites. Right. And that's because of the choices that we made. So programming language, for example, we are largely a Java shop. Right. Mainly because of the fact that uh, one, general from a maintainability of the code. Right. Uh, talent availability and our own experience, Java kind of ticked all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Any of the uh, slightly more organized programming languages, whether it is Go or anything else, uh, tends to have a certain uh, maintenance problems over time, irrespective of the ability to move much faster mm -hmm. in the early days. From a data store perspective, uh, uh, we stuck with uh, uh, MySQL. Right. We use MariaDB, uh, Galera cluster, active, active. But we took a decision to ensure that we were uh, sharded from day one so that we have a significantly higher level of scalability on the data store. Ultimately, you live or die by the scalability of your data store. Yeah, yeah. Right. So we've been completely sharded by day one. We've chosen to actually have application uh, agnostic uh, sharding library. It's a bundle that gets built in. Uh, Dropwizard bundle, we use Dropwizard as our uh, development framework right. for our Java applications. So every, each and every one of our databases, irrespective of size of the data, is typically sharded. So that we never get into this uh, model of having to actually shard a monolithic database later on or keep resharding. We do, we do reshard and we do split clusters, mm. but uh, we've had that architecture from day one. Right. We made choices on being, uh, so we choose what is called a shared nothing architecture, wherein the application that is fronting a data store is the only one that is allowed to cache the data. And any sort of uh, uh, data resolution uh, uh, has to go through a scatter gather uh, and we will not allow uh, forward caching. So you don't have this postman model of large data stores or blobs that are get, getting built closer to the ingress to be able to support performance. Right. We don't do that because one, in terms of payments, you want to ensure that you don't have an eventually consistent model or any sort of yeah. staleness. Secondly, I think uh, one of the learnings again from Flipkart was that it's very, very difficult to start doing performance profiling for scale events like Big Billion Day mm -hmm. if you actually allow for that because you really don't know how the work profiles are going to be yeah, yeah. because you have uh, data caches all over the place and you're then effectively building scale for each and every service in the company. Yeah, yeah. So what we wanted to do was ensure that we have the ability to actually scale clusters or ecosystems within the uh, larger uh, phone pay tech stack at the merit of what they need to do, like a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, system would have a significantly higher scale, uh, not anymore, now uh, merchant transactions has gone up, but in the early days, compared to say a recharge, which would be significantly higher compared to a bill payment, right? Mm -hmm. So the ability to actually have that kind of flexibility meant that we went with a very strong shared nothing architecture, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that we were very chatty. So internally we'd be extremely chatty. So right. that was a choice that we made, we've stuck to the choice, it has its own uh, cons, but those were some of the choices that we made. Nothing really has, uh, so one of the learnings that we had though is that uh, very openly, I think a lot of, so my skill set also significantly more on the uh, backend side and distributed systems uh, data stores. Yeah. And my uh, appreciation for mobile engineering while being high, my knowledge is very low, right? <laughs> and uh, I think uh, there have been times where possibly I have not done justice to my mobile engineering team because they actually then have to go through this whole thing of calling many APIs, yes. uh, having to actually uh, uh, do a large amount of transformation uh, on the app side right. and then do. So the choice that we made there, although was a good choice, we actually have a complete uh, store forward model and we actually have a stack that is a, uh, a core kernel stack, a network stack, uh, and uh, application programming on top. So we don't treat our mobile apps as dumb clients. 
So that's always been the case, yeah. right? So it is a full-fledged front-end and back-end in the mobile app itself, the way it should be. Right, right. That was there, but they've also been forced to actually uh, have very high level of interaction with the back-end and sometimes actually construct a lot of the uh, uh, knowledge streams or data blocks on the client side of it. Right. So over time, some of that has changed. We've tried to build more composite uh, layers on the backend to actually bring together some of the services or ecosystems so that the load on the app is lower. Right. But I think uh, one of the, uh, to answer your question, what has been the learnings, I think to try and design this much more from a ease of mobile engineering perspective, right. a decision, and that's been debated by the way, it's not something that we're not aware of. It's just something I don't think we appreciate it enough. And I think that's been the change now. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for you, it's, it's, it's important uh, also because like all your users are on mobile. and Yeah, uh, yeah. For, yeah, mobile only. That to keep evolving that app over time and uh, features hitting the user always, it's happening on the app. And Correct. And for that to be able to be agile is very important. Yeah. Right? Uh, I mean, how, how the app looks like, for example, has, uh, I mean, my experience with PhonePay has been it keeps transforming every year, like new things coming in, old things going away. So that agility is always important for you, I believe. Yeah, and I, so we are, a, uh, we've always been a complete native platform on the app side. We've yeah, not yeah. gone with any cross platform. We had React Native for a while, but uh, our experience with React Native wasn't that great. Uh, we obviously, so we have a clear documentation on when, uh, what should be React Native. So we do have a switch platform, which basically allows third party apps to actually host within the yeah. PhonePay app yeah. and it supports React Native bundles as well as pro progressive web apps or just even M sites. But beyond that, our own app no longer uses React Native. Mm -hmm. We saw issues with uh, uh, performance and didn't really necessarily see the enough value from the agility that you'd get across uh, the, uh, the two platforms. Also, I think from a security perspective, from the ability to actually run a lot of edge models, the ability to utilize the native platform more. Yes, it's always it's there. always there. And then to have a hybrid approach where you're not fully on a, a cross-platform stack. It's the worst of both. It's the worst of both. <laughs> because I'm just building bridges yes. and exposing bridges yeah. and then increasing the work. Yeah. So the realization was there. So we've, we've been uh, native on the uh, uh, Android side and the uh, iOS side. Yeah, yeah. And, performance, like and ultimately those... performance is it's key. It's key, right? I mean, PhonePay is a utilitarian app wherein you get in and get out as fast as possible. Yeah, so yeah. the one thing that we don't want is necessarily to try and have you linger in the app. Yeah. So I wanted to ensure that you get in, is it your fast tag top up at the toll booth? You should be able to do it <laughs> fast yeah. enough, right? Yeah. So performance matters a lot. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, we've been uh, completely native all the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I because the fast thing I still remember uh, I I gave a talk on, on uh, payments at uh, that fifty uh, p conference by Hasbeek. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was basically on like you know a uh, lot of payment gateways. There's a lot of things nested. Like there's an app inside that. There's a PG inside the PG. Some mWeb opens inside that mWeb. Some probably OTP screen by somebody else opens. Then you have overlays for capturing the OTP. Oh, overlays for capturing <laughs> the OTP, right? Uh, so my talk was mainly about. Just, just sort of spreading uh, security awareness to the end users that in that final screen where you're typing the OTP. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm uh, in the talk, there's a big disclaimer in the first slide itself. So I'm not accusing any particular person here. Obviously, nobody's collecting your data. Uh, like nobody's reading the OTP there. But technically, they can. There is no way for you to know whether they can or not. Right? The, the OTP overlay, the PG gateway, probably like the bank has some third party like Vibmo or somebody who's like creating that you know web screen there and and whoever has made the app itself like could be a e-com app food app or something like that and then that app is running inside an OS that OS can also be key logging you yeah. so like probably like seven <laughs> stages like nesting and everybody can uh, sort of uh, read that uh, stuff from there um, and then somebody was probably asked, I think, during that, like, you know, what's a lot of a bet better alternative? And this was two months after demonetization, right? What's sort of a better alternative? And there was like a meme slide in my, like, I said, like, cash is still a better alternative because even if you lose the security part of it, uh, it is still fast. Like, I think uh, I, I was mentioning in the talk, like, just like Netflix says, right? we are competition is with sleep. Yeah. And like for a payment gateway, it will always be, competition will be with cash because take it out and give it and like, that is the speed that you need. Yeah. 
because that's what people are habituated with like at a petrol pump for example like whipping out a 510 note and giving that it's not always true though no there's a change aspect to it there's a change aspect yeah. so, but if there's a no change then that's still the fastest uh, but when it's change then interestingly obviously. any economy as yeah. it grows the change problem only increases increases right because think about it now yeah when was the last time you saw a 5 rupee note or even a 10 rupee note these yeah, days yeah, yeah. right 50 is probably the lowest that you kind of get to yeah. but that the change problem is never uh, uh, normalized to the lowest note yeah so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, petrol pumps is actually still the only place where I sometimes do give cash. Yeah. Uh, because there's no change problem there. Yeah. <laughs> filling up a 2,000 yeah. or 3,000. Uh, Correct. Uh, not, not filling something like 2,340. <laughs> <laughs> there, and uh, change, I think anything like below 1,000, like unless there are three zeros at the end, it's always card or UPI. Yeah. Uh, that's that's uh, always how it is. No, I think it's a very fair problem. Uh, why UPI is winning, yeah. in a way, is also because of that. See, while it may, uh, security at the core of it, entering a pin in a uh, crypto library that has its UI that is actually, so the CL is uh, given by NPCI, it's owned by NPCI, it's built by NPCI, and after that, it is uh, encrypted transfer of that yeah. pin all the way through the network. You don't have, you have very few hops, huh. which effectively mean that you have very few actors, yeah. right? You hear, you go to the NPCI switch, and from the NPCI switch, you actually go to the issuing bank and the other bank, the, the, receiving, the bank. receiving bank. So I think the speed, the reliability, and the security ultimately is better in UPI, and therefore it is succeeding. Because ultimately that translates as convenience. Even if a user doesn't understand any of these specific aspects, yeah. the cumulative nature of this yeah. is something that stays with the user, mm. right? Just the number of hops that you're seeing with a uh, 3DS yeah. uh, card payment today, okay. even for the uneducated about how payment happens, it feels kludgy yeah. as experience and possibly insecure. Yeah. Right? But you can, like as an end user also, you can see you can five see actors. Inside. Five actors coming in, right? Yeah. And suddenly that uh, uh, trying to actually read your OTP to automate it, yeah. you don't need the smartest person to think that, you know what? There is something that is possibly not right here. <laughs> and uh, as as the uh, population gets more and more educated, you have to start moving to a model like UPI hmm. to be able to actually say that, you know what, you win on all three aspects, which is speed, reliability, and security. I think I like the thing that uh, the, the pin screen, for example, uh, like from day one, the architecture of UPI was that is something that the library will supply. Yeah. It makes it consistent. And uh, it's something that people identify with already. So if you see a different kind of pin screen, you already know that, you know, something is wrong. So uh, I think that that probably does uh, work on the trust factor a lot for people because, you know, like pin you're putting in a Beam UPI screen, mm. whatever be the app. Right. Uh, no, I think it's also a very thoughtfully future provisioned design choice. Hmm. I think one uh, the thing about UPI, everybody knows about UPI with all its uh, scale and what it does, etc. But the, the way the UPI protocol has been designed, right. there is a very clear separation of concern between authentication and authorization. Right. Which is phenomenal, right? I mean, that simple thing goes a long way. Right, right, right. Being able to actually authenticate you and then authorize this transaction has almost two different legs, but uh, supported in a manner that is one interaction from an end user perspective, it unlocks so much potential. Tomorrow, you could use UPI for... Uh, uh, KYC. Hmm. You could say, I have authenticated the person. Let's do KYC instead of a, a transaction. Like the bank balance check kind of thing happens. Bank balance check happens. It's like pure that, auth, right? not yeah, authorization. Correct. It's pure auth. Authentication, yeah. not authorization. You could do uh, document signing. So the protocol it by itself is not necessarily just a payment rails. Hmm. right? And it's purely because of the choice of uh, separating authentication and authorization. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, authentication authorization is one of my favorite uh, topics, like at Scalar when I teach classes, like there's a whole class on identification versus authentication versus authorization. Uh, and a lot of times I've seen like software engineers who have been doing this for a while also don't have a very clear idea of like, uh, and I ask them like, let's say you go to Google, you search something like, has any of these three things happened? And a lot of people say no. I'm saying the identification has happened. Exactly. <laughs> they know who you are. That's in, right. fa in fact, the four-party model in UPI, yeah. which is so popular, where you can be an app yeah. that is not your banking app where you're sending money, and the receiver can be an app that is not the receiving bank, and then there's a receiving bank and a send, uh, sending bank that is different, is possible only because of this. Yes. 
if you don't have that you have to be on the same app that is your wallet sending model. app wallet model yeah, yeah. How, how has that change been though uh, from from i think uh, both as a business perspective and also for a, from a tech perspective that you know originally there were a lot of people on phone pay wallet also right now i think it's mostly all upi right i think we were actually interestingly we never started our journey uh, on the wallet hmm. so the phone pay wallet came in after upi yes that's uh, what i mean technically uh, in fact uh, the very first very first uh, ad that we put out there is your bank is your wallet so uh, when we merged back into flipkart there was a positioning against other payment providers at that time which is like i think free charge paytm they were all wallets correct they were all wallets they were all they were all uh, ppis as we PPIs, call it prepaid yeah. prepaid instruments yeah. and we were positioning as the new alternative to prepaid instruments also because we felt that we were very very gung ho on the fact that upi just because of the constructs that we are talking about would be the one that would become the payment rails for the nation right, right? the prepaid instrument always had this unnatural association of trying to move money from one legitimate source i should i shouldn't use the word legitimate one source of money into an other source of money just to be able to use it in a easier manner yeah that is for like intermediary stage it's a intermediary stage which for even if the convenience that comes in from the transaction is there most users don't think like that a priori they don't think of the fact that i need to keep money here to be able to transact it has to be natural thing is when i want to transact it should happen naturally Yeah, yeah yeah right and therefore therefore i felt we felt that you know what upi would actually win but when we actually merged uh, into flipkart flipkart had the uh, ppi license yeah as part of their uh, attempts on payments so far yeah. and since we were the it was possible to keep money in a flipkart wallet already i think at that time right they were they were already keeping there was a yeah, yeah. Uh, flipkart pay or flipkart wallet at that point i used to keep money there because remember because i mean is instead of paying for every order Uh, yeah it's just easier to put 5000 rupees correct, there correct 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 and so we kind of inherited the wallet okay uh, at that point that we became flipkart we didn't have intentions of actually putting a wallet out there but having said that i think the wallet uh, uh, does play a uh, role in the whole of this like uh, refunds hmm. or returns something that if it is back to source is not instantaneous from whichever source yeah. like cards is never instantaneous it takes a while yeah. uh and if there's a choice to take that money by the consumer into their uh, prepaid wallet which allows you both ubiquitous usage of that money as well as uh, possible to withdraw it on a need be basis i think it's a great solution mm-hmm. for uh, uh things like you mentioned where you want to park money for multiple back to back transactions that you want to do i think it's great so i think i think uh, for travelers right uh, the wallet i think is a great solution if you're able to actually uh keep money there and use it very simply in a limited manner with a limited kyc and all yeah, of that yeah. so i think the ppi instrument does have a role to play but it is not the all instrument for payments as it used to be positioned right 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 uh and i think there are also i think regulatory restrictions around p2p on ppis as well right yeah i think it's you, uh, you can uh, both uh, the sender and the receiver have to be uh, fully kyc fully kyc not just on a min kyc to be able to actually do a peer to peer transfer between wallets right. yeah yeah and i think uh, uh, without a full kyc you can't withdraw also the money yeah. out of it and yeah. all of that uh, all of that is there yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, which makes sense, obviously. I mean, otherwise, it just becomes a money laundering machine at that scale. <laughs> true, true, true. And I'd like to uh, ask also a, a little bit on uh, you know uh, the mobile side of the things as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, although uh, you admitted, like you know, <laughs> probably, uh, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so, uh, what have been sort of the challenges in in terms of uh, scale on mobile? And I'm asking this because like scale means variety rather than number in in a client side right i mean yeah. you are getting to uh, let's say today today at phone pay scale rural india the places where you know your last mile internet is is of a wide variety yeah in that sense and the last mile devices are also of a wide variety uh, right so um, what have uh, been sort of the challenges uh, to you know uh, stay agile keep uh, you know coming up with like today the app has so many features like insurance and, and a lot of uh, financial products and all uh, what has been the challenges in staying agile keeping out with these features while also you know staying with this user base which is like extremely varied across like lots of different stratas yeah uh, i think uh, there are two parts to it one is in terms of how we think about 
continuously innovating from a feature perspective or a uh, offering perspective to the user. Yes. I think one of the things that we've been uh, very, very conscious about uh, is the information architecture that we have on the app, yes. right? So we, we've tried not to actually overwhelm the user by maintaining a very, very strict information architecture. Right. So, we are, uh, so we have this uh, consumer journey that we've been also very vocal about. I, I talk about it in a lot of forums where we say that our consumer journey is basically the consumer's journey with money, starting with send money, moving to spend money, then to manage money and finally grow money. Right. Right. Send and spend are, uh, the name obviously says what it means. Yeah. Uh, manage is your things like bank balance check, maybe opening an FD, uh, RD kind of stuff. And then grow is where you come into financial services, yeah. right, which is uh, insurance for protection, uh, investments through mutual funds, and then lending at some point where it's... Uh, getting money for a rainy day or emergency or even just by choice. We've said that we need to graduate a user through this, which means effectively we should never really own any user at the wrong life stage with any of these products. Like I would never put uh, insurance in your face when you just actually onboard it as a user. So our homepage is always for what we call as send and spend. And even in spend, it's primarily for the top of the funnel, which is recharge and bill payment. So you'll see a peer-to-peer -peer recharge bill payment, and it's very, very sticky. Yeah. So and then those choices are sometimes uh, hotly debated because uh, that's the real estate where you get people to try out more and to merchandise. Uh, or personalize, which is even more debated, right? You want to actually personalize. You have so much data, you know what's the next best recommended action, etc. But uh, unless you're catering to the top of the funnel use cases, which are not just acquisition use cases, but also repeat, right? Our level of repeat is extremely high on these. And we are utilitarian. You have to not, you don't have to, you should never veer away from that. So our information architecture for the homepage is very clear. Then there is stores and spending, which comes in the next one. And then there is uh, wealth, and then there is insurance, and then there's transaction history. So our tabs are actually almost a mirror of our consumer strategy. So keeping an information architecture pristine and trying to actually stick to that has been one of the things that we've done, especially for tier two and beyond, mm -hmm. where you want muscle memory to develop, yeah. and you don't want to be funky with design or personalized to the extent that they're seeing different things, right? That famous case study of that uh, the Amazon's magnify button or something. People thought it's a tennis racket. Correct, right? correct, <laughs> exactly, right? And uh, if you want to be utilitarian at the core, and you want to have a very high frequency of repeat usage for a category, the burden of cross-sell is on you in a more intelligent manner than to be able to actually say that I'll just put it out there, which is a dumb manner, in the homepage for you all yeah. the time. So I think information architecture becomes very important. Fragmentation, especially obviously in the Android space, not on the iOS space of devices, is a huge challenge, right? Uh, the amount of investment that goes into ensuring that the scan and pay with the camera and the camera capabilities and the uh, ML toolkit on the device itself to be able to run it faster. That's a constant work that we do. So we actually look at, we have a very high level of instrumentation yeah. about performance of all our key flows on the app. And we keep looking at uh, it from a, a segmentation of device. Yeah. Because uh, at a uh, overall level, the performance seems great. Right, you may be uh, significantly skewed by the uh, Samsung devices, etc., where the transactions in the metros and the tier one are very high, and then uh, all the other devices that you typically don't, but form a very large long tail in the country, yeah. will not appear there. So we look at all our instrumentation data by uh, devices to see that what is the opportunity to improve, and any improvement there has a even a massive improvement on the other devices. Yeah. Uh, that's how we actually uh, moved on from being a very basic architecture to a clear backend. Our network library is optimized for uh, our own performance with uh, QoS built into it over and above what the HTTP library uh, offers uh, out of the box, where we define what is the QoS, we have priorities for uh, various traffic, we actually control when a config sync happens, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lazy config load, uh, uh, silent PN, so we have a pub sub, uh, PNs itself not fully reliable. There's only a certain level of delivery rate yeah, that you yeah. can uh, get. So building out our own uh, uh, PubSub system on the back end on HBase to be able to actually have subscribers uh, and some of them just like almost uh, pull notifications that come in and with different priorities to be able to actually instrument action. So on top of that, we have... So pay requests and all, it's very important, right? Exactly, exactly, right? Extremely for, important. For, you for have a lot to, of people, PN is just marketing. For you, it's... Core flow. Yeah, and it's not PN. So P, it's no longer a push notification. It is uh, 
there is a combination of push there's long polling ha huh. of course all you have to do all of those things you have to do all of it right uh, somebody have, might be waiting on a checkout page <laughs> <laughs> we have yeah, we have timers running that yeah. have to wake up the app yeah when we do that we have to look at what is the battery utilization cpu utilization are we appearing on the top level there on an os and then getting auto killed by oem mm. we have to start looking at all of that right and we have to actually it's a it's a uh, theory of constraints that you have to operate with on the app side but to make sure that your just in time messages get there just in time yeah yeah right so there's a lot of engineering that uh, goes into that front right we have uh, on top of the pub sub system we have now a uh, uh, instruction model yeah. where the app can actually create instructions those instructions can get downloaded and executed on the uh, app side nice so i think there is a lot of this engineering that needs to get done just to handle this fragmentation i mean Uh, this is iOS is great that way. <laughs> this is where going for something like React Native makes you it's lose. Impossible, lose. Impossi- right. impossible. No, no. We Because realize that we have to write this. We can never anyway. be all or nothing with a, a, a cross-platform yeah. uh, stack. We cannot be. You can't do all of this. And if I have to do all of this, there's very little I get over and above. There's some UI similarity. I mean, that's that's probably ten percent of your work, and most of it goes into stuff like and this. And you know what? UI similarity also is slightly overrated. Hmm. A user on iOS doesn't necessarily have to. see it exactly the same way they have a certain yeah, different yeah whatsapp has been different on ios and android right from day one exactly. and like that's the most used app in the world right exactly i mean uh, i think that whole thing about uh, trying to actually combine uh, ui through a, a cross platform stack is slightly overrated i think agility is there 100% yeah. but for us that agility is not of value because we have to do all the hard work on the uh, uh, native side anyway right 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 and finally from an organization itself i think we've organized ourselves in a manner to so i think the engineering part of it there are a lot of such examples that we get in that we have to actually uh, uh, do uh, outside of just even uh, network optimization and uh, configuring a lot of uh, models that we actually do simple things also reminders etc we actually do it only on the edge we don't pick up from the server side yeah. mainly because of the fact that it doesn't make sense especially when the network is uh, patchy to be able to do that and we don't really value trying to accumulate data for no reason mm. so we prefer not to do that so we do a lot of edge models so we have our own uh, uh, push servers for edge models that go out it get executed on the app itself it stays there so effectively if you uh, uh, completely delete the app and delete the cache etc it has to actually reload really? that so uh, we live with that both from a combination of respecting data privacy as well as accounting for the fact that you uh, capability on devices and uh network is not consistent right finally from an organization perspective we operate in something called pods something that we are very proud of but has its own i love pods yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we have a blog out there of how we do pods so specifically with mobile engineering right. most companies so back end typically has verticalized teams that are there for various systems and including uh platforms as well as business teams engineering becomes this horizontal team that ends up holding a sprint by sprint an engineer starts working on these two weeks a sprint for a uh, recharge pod next two weeks is on fast tag and then suddenly you're on config sync etc if every software engineer is a product manager that's how we operate yeah. saying that you every software engineer is a product manager you have to be thinking of the problem statement end to end you have to be working with business you need to understand the business metrics you need to have stickiness to the problem statement yeah, I mean, this and context work. which does not work this context which just does not then work become a consultant you become what you call as a developer yeah right you're just a developer and you we don't hire developers we are software engineers so pods basically is not a percentage prioritization model it's a man to man mapping it is basically saying that x y e in the android team they have, so our mobile engineering team uh, every per- engineer has two identities you're part of the android team and you're part of pod x could be as specific as life insurance yeah could be as specific as p2p payments could be as specific as chat yeah. and you stay with that pod for a fairly long period of time at least a year where you develop expertise in that problem statement and you develop the understanding of the domain so that you start contributing back as a business owner yeah and as it's a, a product manager well, right? i mean having uh, like every member of the team like from design to engineering uh, to operations who understand the domain it just makes your productivity 10x and a lot and of people don't that realize that that is the that. main reason we are able to do the number of things that we do everybody asks us and we have to be like that it's not even i mean uh, if you take phone pay as an app it is a combination of uh, p2p apps what cred does we do what 
grow doesn't part or zero that doesn't part through mutual funds we do yeah. then there is some um, something that say uh, an aqua does or a policy bazaar does so we are a company of companies if i have to compete my right to compete with everybody as a single platform is only when i actually have the same level of agility mm-hmm. so pods allows me to do that so it's not even something that is nece- uh, it is necessary hmm. if our canvas is as broad as we have painted it to be and our ambitions are as broad we need a structure like that yeah. so i think that also helps us uh, stay i wouldn't say nimble i think we still have our own challenges now as we've grown the ecosystem has got more complicated the back end services have become a beast by themselves etc but i think from a pure focus from a bandwidth we don't do that what is the t-shirt sizing of this project how many man hours we don't do any of that shit we don't i mean <laughs> that uh, i had done that in flipkart and it really hurt so we don't do this three and a half man hours for this week for this project kind of thing right yeah. we say that these are the engineers part of this pod that's the number of engineers that we have go figure right how much you can do it's also a great forcing function to ensure that products go from a v0 to a v1 to a v2 without trying to do the next shiny object yeah. everybody tries to actually gain more out of being incremental and being incremental is not wrong yeah. <laughs> versus being maverick and launching something new yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i i i uh, the pods is a the model i've, I've always uh, liked uh, and i've always uh, seen uh, uh, for you know front end teams uh, mobile or web or something like that uh, like at scale also uh, pods plus platform kind of a model works well like if if you have stuff like uh, like a somebody who's taking care of ci cd things like like your building blocks like networking maybe you can have a platform team who takes care of that but features that users see that's always pods uh unless you are very dogmatic about pair programming a pod can be as small as one person uh but two pods will never work on the same product one pod can take up two products that's yeah. that's possible and that's needed i mean <laughs> i don't think uh, now i think we have the luxury we've grown fairly large uh but in early days over subscription was the way to go like yeah, uh, one pod with two products and, is fine and we and we had to actually prove out the pod model by having a few po- pods start showing the value because when you it is it is sub optimal from a people perspective as you grow no question right it does get sub optimal because very difficult to actually give dedicated attention to more than say two pods or three pods and at that point you want to actually say that if you give a freedom to a particular engineering team auto- autonomy is very important you can't always hold the bar of saying that you have to build reusable stacks always i think that's how so we rationalize later hmm. versus take an approach of saying that keep building common platforms because then you're not allowing people to move fast enough correct so both from a people perspective and from a, a technology stack perspective it may not be the most optimal and you have to that's the give but i think just from what keeps engineers excited and what adds significant more value to the business directly yeah. top line or bottom line i think it makes a lot of sense yeah. and engineers are also so much closer to their purpose yeah. when they're working in yeah. pods for example and that's very important because i see most of the times people losing interest when they lose it will they become too far away from the purpose exactly i mean the smartest building. engineers my belief is that what technology are working on all of that you can experiment on or with or without having the company or business that you're part of impact that you create learnings that come from that impact to be taking that back to the problem statement and fixing it and taking it back to market that kind of gratification is what keeps engineers most excited right right it's not necessarily just what's the technology stack that i'm trying out etc right 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 um i have another question which is on uh, i think something um, uh, kailash when he was here he was discussing about uh, um, and, and i think it's a if the, it's a problem that affects zero day for sure it affects you is the regulatory challenges mm. right and like i want a engineering answer for that which is like uh, how do you approach the very fact that you know you live in a regulatorily challenged environment right i mean it it keeps changing <laughs> i think you have a flight today for regulatory reasons <laughs> right so sometimes you build things which you might have to throw away because you know can't use it anymore or something like that um so kalash was for example talking about like they they always build things knowing that you know you might have to change it you might have to throw it away you might have to rebuild it using let's say a different set of policies around that i believe it's, it's same for you as well uh, so i'm engineering how do you Uh, approach the fact that yeah. you know regulatorily uh, reasons would come up for which like a re- re-architecture might be needed on this thing i think you just embrace it but slightly different than how so we try not to necessarily throw away stuff 
Okay. So what we do is one is I think uh, we are regulated by all the three primary regulators that is <laughs> RBI, SEBI as well as uh, IRDA. Yeah. Right. It's payments, it's uh, uh, mutual funds, and mutual investments, funds. and then there is insurance. Uh, insurance. Uh, we have uh, north of uh, 40 plus audits a year that happen, and all of the audits ultimately audit the system. Right. Uh, one is uh, engineers. Uh, are part of the compliance team that actually works with the auditor. Set of engineers that are there, especially on the infrastructure side, are part of it so that they actually understand the where the auditor is coming from right. much more closely. And then we build on, from there, from an infrastructure uh, side of things, right? Uh, so whether it is about how database deployments happen, how, are, uh, how the provisioning happens, how the permissions are set, Right. What are the uh, read and write permissions? How do you actually abstract out such that you can only access it systemically? Developers don't ever come to know what your uh, uh, read write permissions are. Mm. And that is separated out through the operations team who have no clue about what's the data model and uh, uh, how the data is being stored right. is now a, uh, it's called the ROSI system. It is basically a common infrastructure that all deployments happen only through ROSI, which automatically abstracts out your uh, access to your databases, et cetera, and provisioning of the same, right? Yeah. So that's an example of how at an infrastructure layer, we're trying to ensure that we have ticked the box, not just from a form perspective, but from a substance perspective also, right? right? right. Similarly, uh, what are the other models that you can do from uh, data anonymization, event streams that are coming up, how do you actually build uh, uh, technology? that can ensure that uh, things like, uh, can you look at all the event streams yeah. and look at data patterns that make sure that masking of data, mm -hmm. removal of data, yeah. et cetera, happens in a layer that you don't have to actually go and discover, oh, some other application got deployed that is actually also entering this data, which is actually getting logged, which is not supposed to be getting uh, logged. So I think we take opportunities of learning from the auditors, trying to generalize that to infrastructure level changes that we make being fairly, I would say, compared to a lot of companies uh, autocratic about how you build out your systems on what infrastructure, what are the choices that you make on data stores, right. kind of helps there. We don't really encourage tech for the sake of tech. Just because I got excited about a new data store, can I try it out? Yeah, you can try it out, but you have to actually prove, not just from characterizing the uh, data store, for example, from an IOPS perspective, performance perspective, read write patterns, but also from the perspective of whether one, you can apply the controls that we need to apply right. from a, a, a regulatory perspective. Two, does our current infrastructure automatically support with minimal changes that particular thing? If it doesn't, even if it's probably a better data store, for example, from a pure performance perspective, right. we'd possibly not make that choice. Right. So I think uh, that's how we think about uh, regulation and we need to think like that because at the scale, and scale is not just about the number of payments, it's also the number of things that we do for us to be able to cater to uh, some of the uh, changes that come from a regulatory perspective in an ad hoc manner is also very difficult. We are also significantly more widespread from a usage perspective. For example, compared to say a Zerodha, right? Very large concurrent uh, number of users, but it's a cohort that is actually very well defined. Yeah. For me, I don't have necessarily a well-defined cohort. It's the entire country. Any everybody's change, doing everything. <laughs> everybody's doing everything. Uh, it's all uh, of the population, for example, at least from a sampling perspective, definitely. Mm -hmm. Rolling out any change also is not very simple. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have to be prepared more from the perspective of not making ad hoc changes and learning continuously to say that what are the uh, both primary controls as well as compensatory controls that we can apply. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in for performance, it may not be a complete primary control, but it will be compensatory controls. Compensatory controls could be, like I'm saying, more of out-of-band detection on the data flow to be able to take corrective action versus preventive action. And these are terms the engineering team completely knows now. <laughs> what are compensatory controls? What are primary controls? What is role-based access? What are the ACLs that we can apply? Is kill switch already part of it? Mm -hmm. Kill switch is something that allows us to shut at a very granular level now. I was talking about payments, yeah. but I could use kill switch for anything, everything from login for a set of users or for a particular category or for just a particular action or, uh, or at the context of uh, a user at a merchant at a particular time in the day also. Hmm. So I think building out some of these capabilities at a horizontal level so that we can use it in a manner that we can actually accommodate these regulatory changes is how we've evolved.
nice uh, it's a question that comes from there is uh, like new people who are joining in uh, right uh, in engineering um, product design uh, all of these teams um, what what do you have in place uh, to ensure that they're able to um, sort of learn and imbibe both uh, like like the domain knowledge of uh, you know finance itself yeah the regulatory terminologies right and uh, the jargon that for example your existing systems have developed like yeah. things like you're saying the rosy system through which yeah. you're doing the deployment yeah. and all of those things so uh, what is like a framework or mechanism or rituals in place which makes sure people like absorb all of this we struggle to some extent i think as we've grown we've got much larger systems have got much more complicated we do have an onboarding uh, process and an induction we have videos over time that we've accumulated about uh, tech talks and presentations of uh, a lot of the core systems uh those videos are obviously available to anybody at any given point uh a lot of the uh, senior engineers or tenured engineers actually have a induction program that they conduct for the newcomers right but uh especially given the level of domain depth which is uh, developed over time a lot of that is tribal knowledge <laughs> uh we have good documentation i think uh, one of the things that we did right is uh, we have our engineering confluence pages uh they may not be down to the design specification uh, i think uh, putting in that much effort uh, the engineering team still needs to build that muscle but as a functional specification they're pretty good uh what we lack there now as a lot of newcomers have told us is a glossary for the confluence itself to understand for example <laughs> uh yatra yatra is this amazing uh, user journey tracking system at a user level you're able to track journey you're able to build journeys you're able to create interventions at any given step that connects to a crm system an offer system or anything else right very generic platform used at scale uh most well yatra is very obvious from a name perspective still you would have to know about yatra is to go search on yatra so i don't have a glossary <laughs> i think the next thing is to build that uh outside of that one thing that we've started more recently something called phone pay university right it came from two problem statements one was this about how do we actually uh i wouldn't say upskill but accelerate understanding of our own systems our own approach our design patterns and our design choices so that people can get engineers can get significantly more productive and also uh, have the potential to rotate faster across teams second one was that if there's an opportunity cost that being in part one part of the phone pay engineering team is not giving you enough exposure to uh, data platforms or to uh, core infrastructure how do you actually overcome that because what you want what is my promise at least to my team is that treat phone pay as the your best learning opportunity over the next 5 years and everything else will fall in place right mm -hmm. i mean your uh, I may not be a lifer company yet that's a goal I want to get to <laughs> I want to be a lifer company for uh, everybody who joins yeah but I want to be a company where you say that you know I learned the maximum and therefore I actually got a significant boost to my career wherever I go from here phone pay university was designed for that right and the last one is whenever there is a, a hiring frenzy rather than try to become a part of that I rely on trying to actually upskill and accelerate my existing team so that they get more productive and can do more so as part of that we have programs that uh, the phone pay university has is multimodal it has workshops it has lab sessions it has projects right it has weekend lectures and we take small cohorts that people sign up for nice uh we have tutors internally that we recognize as phone pay university tutors and uh, this is not just tech right i mean right now it's tech right know. now it's only tech and we are looking at actually taking this uh, beyond tech so mm -hmm. it's been running in tech for a little over a year uh, now it's got popular within the company and now uh, other functions are saying that how can we be part of phone pay uh, university yeah. so i think uh, we'll be expanding that and to be able to actually cater to the uh, uh, eccentricities of the business that we are in intricacies of how we operate i think that's a, a great uh, model but we still have to scale that out so we still i would say we still short answer i think 60 to 70% we still rely on on the job learning mm -hmm. and the fact that uh the best go getters who join the company get there faster versus the others the onus is on them i think 30 to 40% we are doing we are trying to actually build the scaffolding for them to be able to uh, uh get productive and get uh integrated faster
Right, right, right. Makes sense, makes sense. And I think great onboarding programs are always superpowers yeah. for companies which 100%. have cracked it uh, 100%. in, a, in yeah. a way. Right. There's another question which I definitely uh, had to ask, uh, which is, uh, as, as a product, uh, do you think like, say for example, not being a bank, uh, mm. is, is, uh, is, is that a boon or a bane or is it a challenge? And I'm asking this from a, uh, coming from like the time when, for example, ES Bank shut down and then you had to over 24 hours move to a different bank. So uh, like looking back, I mean, that's been a few years, but looking back at that history and also looking ahead in the next few years, um what's your take on this like you know do you want to become a bank uh, or like being a bank helps or not being a bank helps i think uh, very straight answer to do i want to be a bank i don't want to be a bank okay. i think uh, i think being a bank and uh, being a fintech and confusing that fintechs can become banks <laughs> is a very slippery slope mm. i think the banking industry age old industry yes the banking industry should be disrupting itself by through technology 100% right but i don't think necessarily somebody like us becoming the bank is the solution right i think in the whole concept of fintech the role that we can play is actually to be that layer on top of banking in partnership with all the banks mm -hmm. to be able to not just create better experiences but to also create completely new products right uh, uh, that uh, we can take to the users right we can be the uh, just like bureaus have been a part of the overall bfsi system providing scores i think using data significantly more intelligently with complete consent honoring uh, the, the user's intention of how they're sharing the data and how we are using that data, I think we can play a very powerful role, right? right? So I think the partnership model, I think works best for us. Uh, I mean, the Yes Bank instance was a wake up call. We were already working towards being able to actually work with multiple banks. Right. So I think BCP or and DR, uh, both on the system side and as a business BCP also, should not be the reason that we should become a bank. If we do ever become a bank, it should be on the back of uh, us being able to, one, truly be the custodian of consumers' money and have all the systems and processes in place and us being able to actually do better than what a combination of being a fintech partner to a bank can deliver today. Right now, I don't see what we can necessarily do better. While our systems and processes from a governance and compliance perspective, I believe are uh, right up there. Right. But I don't think there is anything over and above that I can deliver necessarily today. Right. What I can't do by actually partnering with a lot of the good banks that are out there. But the banking system trying to up their game on a technology front, 100% needed to make this successful. Because right now, right now, that is a journey. I'm still hopeful about the journey. I mean, the investments are there. All the banks are putting in that investment. If that doesn't pan out, then there might be need for, forget phone pay, us or somebody like us to actually become a bank. Right. Right, right. And I, I, I guess the answer would be same if, if I talk about like, you just say you're operating in three spaces, which is like yeah. payments and insurance yeah. and yeah. Uh, investments. Yeah. Not being a bank, does it, uh, you know, prevent you from doing things? I think the, what, what you gave the answer, I believe uh, you'd say the same answer if not being a fund house or not being an insurer. I think, I think uh, while it may sound very boring, we look at ourselves as a highly scalable, performant and intelligent distribution platform. And uh, those three are important. I mean, uh, you could anybody at scale can be a distribution platform. Uh, managing scale with the same level of performance is a huge challenge, right? I, I, I can never overstate the amount of engineering effort it takes to kind of continue the same level of reliability and performance at scale that month over month is uh, still in hyper growth is huge. Being able to do that and being intelligent, which is about uh, using data intelligently, using uh, design patterns very intelligently, using UI very intelligently, I think is the role that we play. And the combination of that with the fact that we are a distribution platform, I think we become great partners for all the industries. So we look at ourselves as smart, reliable, efficient, performant distribution platform. Makes sense. Makes sense. Sounds boring, but that's <laughs> a fact. Uh, but I think I mean there, there's uh, like like a lot to do in in a distribution platform itself. Like I mean, uh, and I was asking the question also because I remember having asked a very similar question in my very early days to Deepi hmm. about like you know should should we should we open a restaurant? Should we have a cloud kitchen? Like you know people are doing a lot of things related to food with us. Like sort of the last mile, like discovering restaurants are doing here, ordering food you're doing here. Uh, even restaurants were ordering, so Zomato had 
acquired this uh, company hyper pure and restaurants are ordering raw material via that it's like uh, like the only part of the funnel left is actually cooking the food yeah. uh, and i think i mean his answer was also like you know see when you cook food that, that's a very different product from what we do we do is you know we are the interface layer we're distributing yeah. and there's so much left to do here itself we, i mean you can open up a se- separate company and start making food but then you know, that's not what zomato does <laughs> so i think uh, it makes sense i mean i probably uh, see a echo of that answer here and then the distribution layer itself has a lot to do and a lot of challenges huge, to solve right just take insurance hmm. right i mean for the size of the economy where we are heading to yeah. the level of penetration that something as important as health insurance or term insurance has yeah is ridiculously low mm-hmm. right and it's a distribution challenge right yeah, why is it a distribution challenge because if distribution gets significantly more efficient pricing will improve the right products will be sold to the right people it is the inefficiencies of the distribution channel that actually forces the possibly the highest revenue and the easiest to sell products on people which as it becomes a negative self fulfilling prophecy of people not really seeing value in the products right i mean a great marketplace with all a the signals really, available really, makes a it a really really good uh, uh, digital distribution channel that is able to personalize the right product for you yeah. and therefore also the right price would mean that they would also start seeing that value and if they see that value you will actually have the word of mouth that typically is ultimately what happens for any product right you might push your product on tv everything else but if you're not solving a problem mm-hmm. you're not going to get virality right okay. and that will happen so i think the role that a, a really good distribution platform digital distribution platform can play is huge yeah and that's that's the scale that we are still need to achieve on that distribution purely on the distribution by all these products if you look at even where the equities market or the mutual funds market is at and what's the retail participation and where we can get to as a population same thing with insurance i think the opportunity is immense yeah i mean with insurance i think uh, like the correct insurance product reaching the correct cohort yeah that uh, you know can make both like the insurers more and money very, and very people ex- will be more covered it's a very very exciting uh, <laughs> engineering problem statement correct correct right correct. Uh, it is almost like an or model hmm. ultimately if you could actually co create products hmm. and uh, start saying that there's a base product and there is a lot of other uh, 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 add-ons that you can add but the add-ons can be actually curated for a particular person based on life stage based on location based on medical infrastructure around them right. based on dependence etc you get to a level of uh, right sizing a product for a person which is a great problem statement to actually solve using tech uh one last question that i have for you um, which is uh, uh you know looking ahead into the future uh, the you know, new sort of uh, things that you're building you uh, we were talking about that uh, that kill switch where you're using you know real time data signals and machine learning models to uh, sort of you know prevent transactions which could probably fail and all uh, i think expanding on that and especially because these days people are talking a lot about uh, like the world has a lot of focus on ai and all mm. um, so uh, where do you see like uh, more such you know uh, smart recommendation systems coming into picture uh, in in pure you know payments and you know insurance marketplace kind of products uh, what sort of things do you already see signals which are happening in this I think uh, a huge role to play. I mean, uh, I think uh, ChatGPT as a tool itself, yeah. uh, however nascent it is, has immense promise. Mm. Uh, uh, building out experiences on the insurance front, where we have held a view of uh, not being uh, a telemarketer, not not making calls to actually complete a sale at all, right? Uh, but being assisted only when you require assistance, and that assistance something that can actually scale significantly hmm. at low cost with very high level of uh, accuracy. I think uh, AI can play a really really good role there, right? Uh, similarly, the journey continues, right? In the life cycle claims, right? And claims processing to be able to actually do that uh, in a, everything from uh, trying to actually understand uh, through uh, uh, visualization right. about what's the extent of damage and possibly giving an instant uh, uh, resolution to actually being an interface almost like a person to be able to have a conversation about claims. Right. I think there's opportunities there advisory on equities advisory on mutual funds hmm. at scale right i mean moment to happen about the uh, common man's uh, portfolio management system and uh, advisor for a country like india where 
the disposable income was very small but the uh, size of the middle class having some amount of disposable income is continuously growing right you want to have solutions like that because the existing solutions that that don't scale obviously for similar reasons of being so when you look at smart distribution i think uh, ai conversational ai uh, great data models and having data personalization plays a huge role right 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 uh i mean looking forward to actually uh, seeing some of those things in place and i really love that uh, like, no telemarketing kind of a model like as a user i don't like being telemarketed to and like <laughs> discovering products through my own user journeys is obviously something yeah. i definitely love um hoping to you know uh, see uh, phone pay leverage uh, more of these models and, and growing um uh, so yeah uh, once again uh, thanks for uh, all the answers shared i think uh, people watching this listening this uh, they would be uh, loving that uh, so once no, again thank you so much i love the conversation very free wheeling and uh, yeah uh, i love the uh, your scaler podcast also and congratulations on the amazing work that you've been doing thank you thank you thank you so much